So Nehemiah chapter 9, starting with verse 1. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord, their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani. And they cried out with a loud voice to the Lord, their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabneah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessings and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanites, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself, as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made up for themselves a golden calf and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And they committed great blasphemies. You and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness." The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples, and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon, in the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them out into the land that you told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand, with their kings and the peoples of the land, that they might do with them as they would." And they captured fortified cities and a rich land, and took possession of houses full and of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets, who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies, who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors, who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had, re after they had rest, they did evil before you, 
and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies, and you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through, their pro- through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, do not let all the hardships seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the king of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to our commandments and your warnings that you gave them, even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them, and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works." Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves, and its rich yield go to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. In the sealed documents are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests." Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, we are thankful for an opportunity we have to open your word today. We pray that you would visit with us, that you would be at work in our hearts. Help uh, make of us people that are uh, eager to hear your word, receptive to your word, responsive to your word, reflecting on what your word says, how that it uh, reveals fault in us. Uh, reflecting on the way that your word makes it clear that there is no fault in you. Uh, We are unfaithful and you are always faithful. And we pray, Lord God, that this truth would be embraced by us in such a way that we both look to you and depend on you for all good things and that we turn from our sins and that we rest in you for every good thing that we could ever long for. Lord God, uh, bless us, bless our, uh, us as your people today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We opened this uh, last uh, sermon uh, in our trip through the Old Testament. Uh, we'll end with this sermon today uh, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, we've been trying to trace the story of the Old Testament and to see how it moves from Old Testament on all the way to the New Testament and is fulfilled in Christ. Uh, We started uh, a bit of what we read in this chapter recounts some of that story, and we'll come back to this chapter later on, but but one of the ways that even this story is told in chapter 9 of Nehemiah is, uh, look how faithful God has been, and look how unfaithful we have been. Uh, And that's basically just the right way for us to read the Old Testament, a faithful God, faithful really to an unfaithful people, giving them better than they deserve. And as a matter of fact, that's the way that we ought to think about ourselves. We are unfaithful, and God gives us better than we deserve. And he cares, he he provides for our sin in Jesus Christ. That's the Bible's overarching story, and that's then uh, part of the the Old Testament's overarching story. Uh, What we see here in Ezra and Nehemiah, then, is that God's people are going going to return from exile... Uh, They're going to return, though, to first principles, we might say. That is that they are uh, centering their lives on God. Uh, Simply put, they were made by God for God. By the way, you're made by God for God. But God's people were made by Him. They were made for Him. And they were to have the worship of God at the center of all that they did. And one way to think about how they got themselves into so much trouble is that they, they moved away from that. They forgot that they were made for God. They forgot that they were made by him and that they were supposed to worship him. They began to go in other directions. And I guess I'm going to hold this out to you. Your life, your life goes in the wrong direction 
When you forget that you were made by God and you were made to worship him and you were made to glorify him. And if something else is the first principle in your life, let me call you to heed the message that God's people needed to learn time and time again in the Old Testament, which is that we were made for God, not to live on our own, to live how we want so long as we're good people. Rather, we were made for his glory. And so, in their return, God's people were to make the worship of God central to themselves and central to their identity. And so, uh, some things that we're going to see happening in this is that they will, they will uh, rebuild the temple. And they will uh, commit themselves again to doing what God's Word says. And so, our outline today really centers on, as we saw that Israel went astray when they failed to worship God or make the worship of God central, we're going to structure our study of Ezra and Nehemiah on this idea of worship And here are the three points. Uh, The place of worship, uh, the act of worship, and then thirdly, the heart of worship. So again, the place of worship, the act of worship, and the heart of worship. Now again, what we're doing in this, uh, what we're seeing here in this book is that this return uh, is not really a whole lot different than the kind of return which God calls all men to do. Uh, All of us, like Judah, have been called to forsake our idols, to put God at the center of our life, and to live life under his rule, that is, under the scriptures. Uh, That's sort of the message we proclaim. You were made by God to not do whatever you want, but to, to organize your life under his word. And we proclaim this to people, and we call them to, to submit to the king of the universe, to the one true God. What we've been seeing in our study of the Bible is that, that God made everyone to live exactly that way. That's a good way to think of Adam and Eve in the garden. They were supposed to you know, live in the place God made for them and to do what God had called them to do, to, to, to obey his, his, the commands that he had given them. And they said, no thanks. We think happiness is, uh, I know God, you suggest happiness is going to be doing what you say. We think happiness is doing what we say. And they found themselves to be terribly wrong, Right? Right? We're still feeling the effects of Adam and Eve's thinking, you know, it's be- we're better off to not obey God. We're better off to do our own thing. And yet we see that message in the Bible, and we still make the same mistakes. We see God's Word telling us to live particular ways, and we're like, you know what? I think my life's going to be better if I do this or I do that. I just kind of think, you know, maybe, I know God's well-meaning when he gave us this Word, but, you know, it's not practical to live this way, and honestly, I'm going to be better off to do my own thing. We're going to keep making the same mistake again and again, and it just proves how foolish we are and how much we really need a God who in his kindness tells us how we ought to live and how he made us to live. Well, anyway, we see that God uh, basically re- realized that if he left his people to do their own thing or to make themselves right with him, they'd never make it. And so we would follow the story through Cain and Abel and through the Tower of Babel and through the flood uh, under Noah. And you're just like, yeah, <laughs> left to themselves, world gets worse and worse. And so God finally says, I'm going to set my love on a sinner. I'm going to set my love on Abraham, and I'm going to make him this great promise that uh, he'll bless all the nations through Abraham, and he's going to make a great nation out of Abraham. And so God begins to do this. We've been tracing that story of the Bible from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the exodus as they were led out of Egypt uh, to their unfaithfulness when they got, uh, they wouldn't go into the land. Then finally they went into the land. They weren't faithful in the land, and we just keep seeing God being faithful to his people and them going their own way. The kingdom ultimately divides because the people just won't do what God says. They won't live uh, rightly under his lordship, and so the kingdom divides. And finally, uh, both of those kingdoms, we call a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, both halves of those kingdoms go into exile. That is, God lets their enemies come in capture them and take them off somewhere else, take them out of the land that he had given them, right? And again, it's all because of their own sin. Their sin has got them into the mess that they're in. And so they're off into exile. The northern kingdom goes first. Later on, the southern kingdom goes. And so when we get to Ezra and Nehemiah, finally they're going to go back into the land, and you're thinking everything is going to be great. What we're going to find out is not, no, everything is not going to be great. Uh, Things are going to be better in some regard. And so we're going to see that maybe uh, what we've been hoping for won't really be satisfied here in Ezra and Nehemiah, and we'll have to wait. There's no more spoilers here. We know it's all going to be made right with Jesus Christ, right? So what they get is going to be better, but it's not going to be all that they had hoped for. And again, that won't come till 
until Jesus comes. But now we're going to try to not say everything that's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah, but some important things. And the first thing, uh, again, that I told you as we had an outline was we were going to talk about the place of worship. Now, one of the ways that you uh, want to think about uh, this book, and one of the things that you might focus on if you studied this book, is this book has some important things happen. They come back into the land, they are able to be in a particular land, and what they're, what they're going to do once they get back into the land is, well, they, they need to make the worship of God central, right? And so you're going to have to rebuild the temple. And so in the book of Ezra, one of the major things going on in the book of Ezra is the temple is going to be built. And so again, we're talking about the place of worship. You have to have a place to worship. Let's, let's rebuild the temple. And other things that happen there in the book of Ezra is also a, bi a bit of a real bit rebuilding of the community, perhaps around the temple. And then when you get to Nehemiah, you may know that they rebuild the walls around the city. And so, you know, they've, you, you have to rebuild. Again, we're, we're rebuilding a place of worship. We've, now we've got a walled city with a temple inside. Things are right. Things are great, right? And that's one way to read what's going on. Uh, God is trying to restructure the people uh, around a place in which uh, there's a city with a temple inside, and in that temple is the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God's presence is supposed to uh, especially dwell, and so everything should be back on the right track. At least that's one way to think about what's going on. And so what God does, uh, we, we can see God at work, and God is interested in this, by the way. God is interested in seeing the wall rebuilt. God is see, interested in seeing the temple rebuilt. And so he calls his people to do this, and, and they build, in chapter 3 of Ezra, they build the foundation of the temple. And that, you can see that in verses 8 and 9. And then they finally worship the Lord. They're like, okay, we've built a place to worship you. Let's worship you. And they get right to it. Uh, Ezra uh, 3 uh, 10 and 11 says this, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priest and their vestments, in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the direction of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel." And there's this idea, his, and this, when you read this, you think, this is, this is what happened when David uh, was worshiping the Lord. And Solomon, he would say the same thing, you know, he is good, his love endures forever. And so we think, well, everything's getting right back on the right track. We now have this temple being, at least the, the, the foundation's being laid, the temple's being built, and this is, this is uh, good. And what we see also, though, and something that we haven't been highlighting as we've been going through uh, our Old Testament study, but I want to highlight today is that the Lord is at work. The reason why this temple can be rebuilt is because God is active. In Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, the first year of King Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation. And that proclamation was basically, you're going to go back and build the temple. And the interesting thing about this, if you uh, don't know much of the background, is that Cyrus is not one who fears the Lord. So what we have here, and this is not the only place in the Bible where this happens, God will work in the heart of an unbelieving king to get what he wants done accomplished. Isn't that amazing? God can stir up an unbelieving king. Now, he can stir up an unbelieving king and make him a believing king. But also, God can just work up, work in the heart of an unbelieving king and say, you know what? And this king all of a sudden is like, hey, I got this idea. Why don't we send the Jews back to Jerusalem to build their temple? I'll help pay for it, right? And you're like, this is the Lord. This is the Lord at work. When we see these sorts of things done, the, the, the author of the book of Ezra is telling us who's behind this. The Lord stirred up the heart of this unbelieving king to make this happen. And then the Lord works on the hearts of the people in verse 5 of chapter 1, saying, um, Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and all the priests and all the Levites, everyone whose heart or whose spirit, rather, God had stirred up, to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And so we see that God rules over this king, this unbelieving king, and then God stirs up his own people, and basically, how does the job get done? The Lord does it. The Lord stirs them up. We see again in chapter 6, a similar thing happens with the king of Assyria this time, chapter 6, verse 22. 
And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful. So again, it speaks about the Lord making the people joyful. And had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Again, how did the people find favor? The Lord had worked in the king's heart, again, to give the people favor in, the, in his sight, in the king's sight. And so we see then that God is at work. So they're able to rebuild a temple, they're able to rebuild a wall, and it really, how, how can we explain this amazing thing happen when they're in, still under the rule of these four nations? It's because the Lord is working in the heart of really those who he's let rule over them. Uh, one of the things we can't think then about this return from exile is that, you know, God's people, uh, you know, were defeated by their enemies, and finally they got enough power to overthrow their enemies. That isn't what happened. They're still under the power of their enemies, and yet God allows them, still under the power of their enemies, to go back and to begin to rebuild and to center their worship on Him. So one of the things, though, that we want to see then is that in rebuilding the temple, they were placing God again at the center of their lives once more. Uh, in building the city of the, uh, the walls of the city, they were seeking to protect this most precious temple where they could, they could worship God. And one of the things that we want to see as we move now from the place of worship, which is a city with walls and a temple contained therein, is there's, that, that that itself is not all there is to worship, right? And we might just think about here in our own, in our own uh, place. It's not enough that we just have a building where we can worship God, Right? We've got a building, and then, you know, there's a service where songs are sung, and so that's worship, right? No, it actually involves the, the people. <laughs> the people worship, right? Buildings don't worship, uh, and you can't pay somebody else to worship for you. You have to worship. And so one of the things that we're seeing here is that the temple and the city are not enough. Now, that may seem odd to you. You may not think of it this way, but I want you to think that the temple and the city are not enough. Now, we don't mean to say that God isn't worshipped in the temple. He clearly is. He's got Levites who are going to make sacrifices. Animals will be brought. Blood will be shed. Atonement will be made, right? We know that, that those are acts of worship. And yet, you can't just... They, the Israelites couldn't just live in a city where, you know, somewhere in the middle, some Levites are doing something, and so they're doing all the worshipping for us, and we can just sit on the edge and live our life however we want. It, it, just, it just doesn't work that way. You can't worship by proxy, right? The Levite, he's worshiping the Lord for me. I paid him to worship the Lord for me. You know, I've, I've given him, we, we provide for the Levites, and so you can't worship God that way. As a matter of fact, yes, it's good that the temple is there, and it's good that the city is there, but what God is calling his people to do is to individually worship him. And so worship happens from the people. God calls his people, again, not to worship by proxy, but to worship from each individual. And it was really the failure. that they, they already lived in a city where sacrifices were offered. And remember, God carried them off from that situation to exile. <laughs> they, they already lived in a city where there was a temple. So it's, we can see that it's not enough that there's just a temple there. And now we know that we're right with God because we live in a city with a wall and it's got a, t it's got a temple. Uh, the Lord found fault in them. You remember we pointed out earlier, he said, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. <laughs> uh, the Lord wants more than just you live in a city where worship of God happens. Uh, and for us, that we just live in a place where there's a church building where everybody can worship. There's more that God wants from you when it, co when it comes to worship than just merely being in a place where there's a building where worship happens. And so one of the things, other things that we see that I think is highly important then as we look at the book of Ezra, books of Ezra and Nehemiah is that the Lord is, um, he is doing, he's calling the people to respond with actual individual worship. And how does that happen? You might wonder, and I'm glad that you're wondering that because I'm going to answer that under this point. The, the one thing, one of the things that the Lord does is, is uh, he has his word read to his people, right? So by, by the way, when you sit in a place where God's word is either being read to you like John just did before we started, or is being proclaimed to you, that's worship, right? So worship, yes, we do worship the Lord when we sing, and yet that's not the only thing that worship is. Worship also involves this idea that we are, I want to hear what the Lord of the universe has to say, 
And as we, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but, and that I actually want to do what his word says. And, and again, this is really the key and a, a major way of understanding what's going on here. So Ezra now comes, and one of the things that he does, even as he comes in at a time period of the rebuilding the temple, he's like, well, rebuilding the temple is good, but I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to read God's word to you. And so we see that in uh, chapter um, well, chapter 7, verse 10, we looked at as we prayed this morning. He, he studied the word of God. Uh, he did it himself, and he taught the statutes to other people. But also, let's see what, God, what he taught the people. And by that, I actually want to fast forward a little bit to, chapter, to Nehemiah. We were just in Ezra. I'm going to fast forward to Nehemiah and look at the first part of chapter 8. So if you want to turn there, we're going to be spending a fair bit of time for the next few minutes in, in Nehemiah 8, 9, and 10. And let's see what we can see in the way God's word is being taught. I'm going to begin reading in chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. So we're probably thinking that it would be men and women and then children that were old enough to understand, and children certainly can understand the Word of God. They were all gathered together on the first day of the seventh month, seventh month, and he read it, read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. Now, I know sometimes people feel like, Uh, 40-minute sermons are kind of long, but early morning to midday is somewhere between five to seven hours. So praise the Lord, I keep the sermons slightly under seven hours here. But but get this, this is what the people wanted, right? The Lord had worked in their hearts in such a way that they wanted to hear his word, right? They, 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 They had a desire to hear his word. So... From morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Right? It didn't say, well, after 45 minutes, people began to doodle on their papers, and after another hour, they began to look around and count ceiling tiles. Right? They were actually, that isn't what happened. They, the people were attentive, five to seven hours of attentiveness to God's word. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for this purpose. Like they were, they were so excited that they could read God's word that they said, let's build a wooden platform where he can stand up there and read to all of us from God's word. A little later in verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood so now that everybody's standing to hear the word of the God, because they, they, they're out of reverence for this word, they're standing, and um, he opened it. As he opened it, all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So now they're receiving the word and they're recognizing that there's a great God being revealed here and they're recognizing their own smallness and they begin to go, hey, they're not thinking, looking around with proud thoughts of themselves. They begin to look down to think, holy is he and sinful am I. And verse 7 lists a number of people that helped in the teaching, including the Levites, and it says that they helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. And they read from the book from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's a little bit of what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to read it to you, and I'm trying to give you the sense. (laughs) And so we might just say this becomes a pretty decent model for what preaching ought to be. Read the Bible, and then give people a sense of what the Bible says. And God's people's response to that ought to be thankfulness (laughs) and and a receptivity of God's word. God's word comes. It is an honor that we have it. People would stand and be glad to receive it and respond to it. And one, the, the things that the people do, what we see is going on is they're not merely just sort of giving this, we know what we're supposed to do, this is the point where we stand, and this is the point where we listen, right? But they actually are responding in significant ways. They confess their sins. 
They recognize their failure and they express sorrow. And actually, the very next verse, chapter 8, verse 9, says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. <laughs> they be, again, they were being humbled by what they were hearing. They began to be thankful for what God had given them, and they began to see their own shortcomings, and they began to just naturally weep over where their hearts had gotten to. And so then we have, uh, uh, skipping over a little bit, chapter 9, that chapter that was read to us by John at the beginning of the service, where they begin to recount how God, again, I'd already summarized this, but I don't do it again for you, how God had been faithful to his people. He had led them out. He had led them out of slavery and led them into a good land. And how God had been great, very uh, faithful and how they had been unfaithful. They didn't try to make excuses for their sins, as we see so many people, right, today. Well, you don't understand the kind of family I grew up. You don't understand what it's like for the life I live. That's why I don't read God's Word, you see, because I'm so busy or because, you know. And so we, we make all kinds of excuses for our sin. And here we see the people actually just owning their sin. No, they're not making excuses. They're saying, uh, yes, he's holy, and, and yes, actually, I'm sinful. This is the right way for us to receive God's word. I begin to be, make excuses or push aside reasons why we're doing what we're doing. The people in chapter 9, verse 16 said, But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commands. They refused to obey, were not mindful of the wonders that you had performed. And later on, and, and well, I'll keep reading, and, and among them, but they stiffened their necks and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God, ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. And what they're basically saying is you should have forsaken them. I mean, they were so wicked. You had been so kind to them, and, and you had showed so many wonders, and they were like, yawn, yawn, I'm not really interested in this. Can we move on to something else more interesting? I'm, I, don't, I don't really think that I would want to live for your honor, for your glory, and submit to you, and to trust you. And they began to think, go in other directions, and the Lord is, basi- and, and the people are basically saying, what wicked people they were. And then they marvel. And yet, you didn't totally destroy them. You were quick to forgive abounding in steadfast love. You didn't forsake them. Or again in chapter, in verse 24. And so the descendants went in and possessed the land and you, that you subdued before them. So again, acknowledging that the Lord had given them the land and the inhabitants of the land the, and Canaanites and gave them into their hands. And so again, saying that God had given them the victory. And then just a couple, then uh, two verses later, verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets. Right? So this is not a small sin, right? Uh, prophet comes to bring the word of God. Uh, your God has said this is how he wants you to live. And they were so sinful that not only did they just politely ignore it, that's kind of the way sin more often happens today, just a, a polite ignoring. Mm, yes, I hear what you have to say, and now the sermon's over, and so now I'll just go do what I want. That's a polite ignoring. Uh, they actually said... Uh, uh, let's take that prophet and kill him. He's, he's telling us to do things we don't want to do. We don't want to hear God's word, and this is what we think of God's word. We'll kill the prophet who brings God's word. And so a significant amount of sin among the people. And then in verses 30 through 33, it says this, Many years you bore with them and you warned them by your spirit through your prophets, and they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hands of the people of their lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are gracious and merciful God. So again, they're just sort of marveling that sin after sin that they did wasn't sort of rewarded with God saying, forget it, I give up on them. And they're marveling that the Lord continued to show mercy to them. Verse 32, and now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardships seem little to you. 
that has come upon us and upon our kings and our princes and our priests and our prophets and our fathers and all your peoples since the time of the king of Assyria until this day. They basically, they're just saying, look, we deserve all that we got. <laughs> we deserve all that we got. And they make it clear in verse 33, yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Again, these people are not, they're, they're owning their sin. They're owning the sin of their people. They're owning their, sin, their own sin. You are faithful, we are wicked. We should have honored you, we should have worshipped you, we should have obeyed you, we should have submitted to you. We didn't do that. When you brought punishment upon us, we deserved it. And again, this is the right way for us as we re re uh, confront God's word is to not make excuses for our sin, to say, no, it is absolutely true. You are a faithful God. You are a glorious God. I should be living my life for your glory. I should be honoring you. I should be serving you. And I go my own wicked way, and I deserve all that's coming to me by way of your discipline. The message then is of God's faithfulness and the people's unfaithfulness. And then what happens in the next chapter, I think that's also important, is they don't just acknowledge that, they, that God is right to punish them, but they also then make a commitment to do what God says, and that comes up in chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 28 through 29, the rest of the people, the Levites, or the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the people of the land of the law of God, their wives and their sons, their daughters and all who have knowledge and understanding, they join with their brothers and their nobles and they enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. Now, I just want to reread two important words there. They enter into the curse and an oath. Isn't that amazing? I just want to remind you what the curse really entails, right? The curse basically means if, right, so, the, so I just want to back up a little bit. They were so amazed by the goodness of God and how worthy he is of glory, honor, and praise that they owned all of their sins. God, you've been nothing but faithful. We've been nothing but unfaithful. And they were so amazed by his great glory and his great, the fact that he put up with them so long that they basically said, uh, God, all you've ever said has been nothing but right, and all we've ever done has been unfaithful. It's astounding that you still care for us, and you haven't squashed us, and you haven't given us up. And so they begin to say, uh, I, know, uh, what, I know the right thing to do in this situation. The right thing to do is to say, look, if we don't do what your word says, because you're so obviously glorious and awesome and worthy of glory, honor, and praise, if we don't do it, curses be upon us. Curse be upon us if I won't do what your word says. You are so clearly worthy of worship. You're so clearly worthy, right? And, and, th and when they say curse upon us, they're, just they're actually still under a curse, right? They're still under the hand of their enemies. They're coming back in. Things are getting better. They're, they're back in their land. They've rebuilt a temple. They've rebuilt a wall. Things are on the right track. And they're like, look, we want to we wanna re-sign up for the curses, if we, you are so clearly glorious, we want to re-sign up for the curses. If we, if we get out of line again, just, just discipline us again, because you're worthy. Isn't that an amazing response that they had to the word of God? Willing to take the curses again, and then they commit to do what they already should have committed to do, and we'll just do whatever your word says. You are God and we are not. You are awe-inspiring, awe worthy of worship, and, and we were made to worship you and to live joyfully under you. And here they are responding, the people acknowledging how right it is for God to be perfectly obeyed. And so what we see, what some, sometimes this is referred to, this chapters 8, 9, and 10, is called a covenant renewal. They renew their covenant with God. They basically say, we will be your people. <laughs> we will do what you say. And I just want to, I want to quickly try to make three points that I think will be helpful to us. It's just three, three sentences, really. Uh, I want you to, I want to review what we've seen the people do and, and pray that God would make us to be these sorts of people as well. Uh, that what the people did that was right was they committed to listen to God. Right? They said, 
uh, your God. We, we need to hear from you. It's right that you speak to us and tell us how to live as your people. You are God. Again, may God make of us the kind of people that say, we want to hear what you have to say to us. We want to hear your commandments because we know they're good and righteous and right. And we know our place is to be those who hear and submit to it. The second thing that we saw the people do was that they were genuinely repentant over their sin. They didn't try to say, yeah, but this, or yeah, but that, or look at what those other people do. They just said, you know, you're right to punish us. You know we're wicked to have ignored you. They owned their sin. And they agreed that God would be right to punish them. And again, may God make of us the kind of people that when the word of God inevitably exposes the sin of us, that we respond not with ho-hum or look what the other guy's doing, but uh, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Give me genuine sorrow for my sin. And lastly, as we saw in chapter 10, they vigorously pursued obedience to God. They basically said, and we'll live your way. <laughs> we, we will stop our, our, our rebellion. We will commit ourselves to do what you call us to do. A commit, commitment to aggressively pursue righteousness. And again, some people say these are three steps to revival. Some people are interested in revival. I'd like to see revival. I'd like to see a bunch of people saved. Just it, it, Obviously, revival, by the way, happens on an individual level, individuals doing this, and you get a bunch of those people in the same room and you've got revival. Does that make sense? <laughs> but you can't be in a room with, with revival where everybody else responds to God's word and you don't. Right? The kind of revival a lot of people want. Everybody else, you know, respond to God. I'm going to keep kind of doing what I'm doing. Uh, it's it's God, God working in the hearts of every individual in a location and then in a large number of people who all are receptive to God's word, want to hear it, long to hear it. When they hear it, they repent of their sins. They say, God is just, I'm a liar. And curses be on me if I won't live as if you are the true Lord. And I'm committing by your help, God, to walk in your ways. I barely have time for the heart of worship, but it's a familiar refrain from this sermon series, so I just want to quickly help you see what's going on. If you fast forward just a little bit to chapter 13, we have this amazing, I think, good example of what the people did in terms of responding to the Lord. And if you go to chapter 13, Nehemiah goes away for a certain period of time because he's really still the employee of the king. He has to go away for a time. When he comes back, the people are no longer experiencing revival. They are, uh, well, they're basically living in sin again. And um, we might wonder, what's the problem here? Except it's the problem that's always the problem under the Old Covenant. See, what the people needed was not just a temporary right commitment to live God's way. They needed new hearts. This is why so much of our journey through the Old Testament made its way through Isaiah chapter 30, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 31, or Ezekiel chapter 36, because what the people needed, they needed... They didn't need another Moses who would give them commands but wouldn't change their hearts so that they could obey it. And God's people here, even in Ezra and Nehemiah, were the, who, who wanted to do what God said, but their hearts were not changed. And God, again, as we've been seeing through this series again and again, God was finding fault with their heart. And he was the alone the one who would change their heart. And ultimately, that would come under the new covenant. It would come when Jesus came. So that promise then... In Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be, cap and be careful to obey my rules. This is what the people desperately needed. This is, this is why this return was a bit of a disappointment because it never was all the people hoped it would be. It, it, it 
uh, brought a temporary right turning to the Lord, and yet their hearts were left unchanged, and what they desperately needed was the kind of life-altering change that you and I can experience through what Jesus calls being born again. Uh, when we are born again, when we are regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, God changes our hearts. And we, by God's grace, don't li- we don't live perfectly, but we have hearts that want to live in God's ways. And again, so the solution to the Old Testament problem is the Savior that would come. The Savior that would deal with their sin once and for all, and the Savior that would come in such a way that He would live within, him, within them by their spirit. This is the solution to the problem of the Old Testament. It's the solution of why, it's the reason why we magnify Jesus as the centerpiece, uh, God's greatest revelation of how he can work in his people and make enduring and lasting change. And we're thankful that by his grace we live under that new covenant time now. Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, we thank you for a time that we could open your word, that we could see. Uh, really some amazing ways that you were working in your people, even under the old covenant, bringing genuine repentance, uh, an owning of sin, a, a hunger to, to, to know what your word said, and a, and a real repentance over their sin. And yet, Lord God, we see the way that, that all of this, as good as it was, was only temporary because it lacked what only Jesus Christ could bring. Uh, We're thankful for uh, the word of Christ and the work of Christ and the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives today. Uh, We pray, Lord God, that we would be uh, thankful uh, for your Spirit's work and that we'd worship you for the greater covenant that we have through Jesus Christ and that we would remember this new covenant even as we partake of the Lord's Supper here now. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.